What did you think of that apology uh, this morning? Well, it was a well-scripted apology. It was heartfelt. It seemed to be heartfelt. Um, how meaningful it is, we don't really know. But I tend to not listen to too much noise in the last two days and try and analyse what's been happening. And what's been happening is there's been a power struggle between elite groups to control football to exploit the fans. That's all it was. It's just a question of who's going to exploit them. So now that ESL is not going to exploit them, it'll be the same old guard. FIFA, UEFA, the Premier League, the big clubs. Because if the fans really won, all of those Chelsea fans outside the ground, how many of them do you think can get tickets for the game? How many can afford the £150 shirts? How many can afford their Sky subscriptions? So it's about still exploitation of the fans. This is what this is. It's just a question of who can exploit them and it'll be exploited by the same old faces. So we're, are we gonna, do we now have an ideal opportunity to attempt, attempt to do something about this then? By doing what? Well, just keeping it out the way I mean, it is. Well, well, keep, so the status quo is now exactly the same. This was, in my opinion, a ploy by the big clubs to then try and get more money from UEFA. But let's not forget, yeah. Ali, you were around then. This started in 92. When an yeah, elite absolutely. group, five clubs, wanted to pull away. And they enticed the other 15 in the Premier League to pull away from the Football League to the detriment of League One, League Two, grassroots football and the Championship because they wanted more money for themselves. That's why the Premier League started. And this is what this group has tried to do. They've tried to do nothing different. That was done in 92. And we've now used... To justify it, we've used, oh, it's not fair on the fans, or it's not fair on football. Is it fair on Crew Grimsby, that the Premier League got out of the Football League, though those clubs are still the same as they were 30, 40 years ago. This whole idea of the 150-year legacy of football is not 150 years. 92, football sold out. Well, my question, John, and I, I don't disagree with what you said, to be quite frank with you, but we, we have seen, I think, in the last 48, 72 hours, the power that the fans have in fan power should they keep going for better rights themselves? Because well, it's not just. I would, I would imagine. Just, my, my point yeah. is, if, if they can do what they've done in the last twenty-four hours, keep going. They didn't do it. Sky did it. The UEFA did it. FIFA did it. That's what happened. Keep going. Well, let the fans keep going. Don't go to matches. We've had this before in the past, where fans said we won't pay the tickets, we won't go to watch the matches, and we are we are trying to convince the fans that they are the ones who did it. Now, but but as much as they've done it, do you think now all of a sudden that? ticket prices are going to come down or the share price are going to come down or sky subscription is going to come down to watch it that's not going to happen we've convinced the masses the working classes that they're the ones look at brexit i know i'm going off track here we've convinced working class people that this is for them it's not it's for businessmen it's for an elite group to continue to exploit people and this is all this is football won't change because uefa want to be the ones to exploit the fans fifa want to be the ones to exploit the fans now these six clubs now they've not won and and the esl has now defunct but nothing will change. Nothing will change. For us to talk about UEFA and, and uh, but you know, these clubs will still be successful because they will get more money from UEFA. Do you think FIFA could ban in international players who played in this competition? Messi, Neymar, Kane, Ronaldo, all of these top players. Do you think the sponsors would be interested in that? Do you think the Premier League could ban this top 16? Do you think the sponsors who put all this money into football is going to say, we're going to keep putting the money in because with all due respect, the Southamptons and the other teams are going to be what the Premier League is all about. This is the elite society we actually live in. And more importantly, when we talk about multi-billionaire businessmen coming to football, have to understand football. It's the other way around. Football has to understand the nature of multi-billion business. And if we're going to accept these billionaires coming in, we are not going to rule them. They're the ones who are going to rule us because that's how they became billionaires, by not listening to what people wanted. So we can't have it both ways. We can't want them to come in, spend their money, but do what we want them to do. That's why a salary cap coming in, better governance, whereby... If you have a salary cap, for example, and a lot of people are talking about I was the first £10,000 a week player that's rich coming from me. Salary cap doesn't affect, the, it won't affect Ali McCoy scoring all those goals. He'll still get top dollar. But, but the other players who earn so much money and the agents who take money out of football won't be getting that money, which will mean that the owners, be they greedy or not, will make enough money to be satisfied with what they have. The problem they have is that because salaries are so exorbitant, agents' fees are so high that they look to chase money anywhere they can to the detriment of the fans because they have to satisfy that need. I totally agree with, with what you're saying, to be honest, John. I, I don't think I can argue with any of that as well. There's so much corruption in football. It extends way above what the arguments have been this week about this one European Super League. The only thing that this European Super League has done is is unified fan bases in, in doing that. Um, I wonder, in terms of corruption, we're about to, to kick off a World Cup where there have been thousands oh, and me. thousands and thousands of deaths in the people that are trying to create those buildings for football to be played in there. Um, you mentioned something about um, legislation change. We've been talking about 50 plus one, the way they do it in the Bundesliga. Does that go far enough for you? 
Well, one man, one man's corruption is another man's business. You know, we've seen what we would consider to be corruption in football. However, if you look at business which is done behind closed doors, this is what this is how the country is run. This is how decisions are made in government. You look at what's happening in government in terms of the corruption, in terms of lobbying. So this is this is what happens in the elite capitalist society we live in. So let's not look at other people and, and, and point the finger at other people. So we may look at that in Qatar and what's going on. And of course, historically, culturally, they are improving, they're changing in terms of what they're actually doing. But we are now pointing the finger at them, say how terrible it is there. But look at the situation here. Now, depending on what you want to consider to be equality, how many black managers are there here? So, shall the black countries in Africa boycott the World Cup in England because there are no black managers? So, so who, who decides what's right and what's wrong? Who decides when we are to, to take the moral high ground and when we're just going to point the finger? So um, I have different issues in terms of whether the World Cup should be in Qatar or whether it should be in England where it should be. But I don't like to point the finger at other people until we get our own house in order. I still believe that the fans have the power, but um, we, I don't know how they can direct it to take it to the next step. That would be my question. The working classes believe that they started the French Revolution. Then an elite group got the power, nothing changed for the working classes. The American Revolution, the civil rights movement, this is how it starts, whereby they're convinced that they're the ones who are doing it. And then as throughout history, you'll then see that nothing changed for them, but it, but it changed for an elite group of people while convincing the working classes and the masses that they're the ones who started it and it was in their favor. So the fans can believe that, yes, we've won on this occasion. When nothing changes for the fans, five years later, something else will happen and we'll use the fans again to start this revolution because the elite group don't want things to change. They want status quo to stay the same. And we say, yes, this is for the working classes. We do this as black people. We talk about George Floyd. We talk about, you know, the, 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 the black um, inner city schools and an elite group of black people get more and nothing changes for the black community, but we say it's in their name. This has been going on for a thousand years. Where we've been trying to convince the working classes, the masses, the average woman, the average gay, the average black person, that it's in your behalf and it's for you, and elite groups of people have got better lives, but nothing changes for them. So I won't be fooled by the fact that we think that this is a fan revolution. Until prices go down, fans have a say, fans can be in the boardroom, fans can do whatever they want to do, that is when the revolution is really won. But that hasn't happened in a thousand years, and it hasn't happened today.